But you know, your influencers, your managers, your leaders, right? One of the things about leading and influencing is understanding people, okay? Understanding that we have different styles in the room, different ways of processing information, different ways of communicating. I don't know how well you know each other. You may have sat down with colleagues of yours. I'm gonna share you some information that will be insightful about the people that have sat around your table. And it'll help me to work out who you are very quickly. Um, who's been subjected in their career to any form of psychometric test? or personality profile, okay. So whether it's Myers-Briggs or Belbin or Insights or DISC, Business Behaviour Stars, there's a whole range of them, right? Most of them are based on Jung's early work. It's usually a four box model, right? Quick, quick questionnaire, first thought answers, pops out a report and says, you're one of these people. These situations you're very comfortable in. These people are a bit awkward, aren't they? You know, and it's all about understanding ourselves and those around us, all valid. I've looked at them all pretty much and I, th I think they're fantastic. Um, some more than others. There's some that take months of time and cost thousands of pounds. And there's one that I found that costs nothing and takes eight seconds and bizarrely the most accurate. And don't take my word for this. Judge purely by results, okay? You'll see the options here. I'll ask you a very obvious question. And it takes a maximum of eight seconds to get a committed answer. The question, of course, is you're one of them. Which one? <coughs> I'll give you the full eight. You probably don't even need it. Three... Two, one. So now you know which one you are. Now, if you're sat there thinking, no, I don't. They're shapes. What do you mean, which one am I? Yeah, no, I know, but you know which one you are, right? There's two I quite like. No, there's not. There's just one, and you know which one it is. Now, in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to tell your neighbor which one you are, and they're gonna tell you which one they are. Now, it's about this point, they might get a bit intimidated in case you don't like their shape. Now, <laughs> if that happens, they might say, I don't know, this is ridiculous. They're shapes. The fact is they do know. There's something called unconscious doubt. You know when you ask one of the team and you want to engage them in the process of trying to solve a problem and you go, so what, what do you think we should do? And they go, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know. They know something, right? But they feel a bit intimidated. It may not land well, their, their answer. It's easy to say, I don't know. They know something, right? And I came across this great technique for getting past conscious doubt. It almost kind of like tricked them into saying something. I want you to test this. If your neighbor says, I don't know, just try this on them. It's not very sophisticated. And they're going, yeah, yeah, we can't decide if we're going to go with your company or a different company. I go, no, I know, I know you can't decide. But if you could, which way would you go? <laughs> and they go, I don't know. I go, no, I know you don't know. But if you did. And they go, well, if I knew, I'd probably blur. Something always comes out. <laughs> so if your neighbor says, it's ridiculous shapes. What do you mean, which one am I? And initially align with them. You want to get rapport, so I agree with you. Yeah, stupid, isn't it? Yeah, stupid, isn't it? Yeah. But if you had to pick one, and you could, which would you pick? I don't know. Yeah, no, I know you don't. But if you did, what would you go for? And they'll go, well, like, if I had to, and something will pop out. They may not even know why it's that one, but their unconscious knows. And then I'm going to tell you what it means. Ridiculously accurate. Judge by results, right? You've got two minutes to make sure your neighbour commits to one of them. <laughs> Try to resist the temptation to explain your selection. <laughs> And I'll tell you why. <laughs> and don't be too concerned which one you are. Uh, it's only a direct reflection of your character, after all. Um, <laughs> in public. So let me tell you what the data says. The data behind this research was leading through difficult circumstances. That was the context. There's usually a context to these things. Now, you may not like the shape, but who found themselves being drawn more to the square than any other one? It's often a minority in the room, there's about six, seven people, same as this morning, right? It always happens this way. These people know, before I even tell them, when it comes to solving a problem, getting through something, getting something done, you can rely on these people. There's something about the way they apply themselves, they kind of get the problem. They, they don't look for the problem, but they get it when it's there, and they don't mess around too much, right? Their brain will process things quickly, and efficiently to get at least three or four options. The square's got four sides, they're all the same, no preference. They don't value judge too soon. Most of us under pressure, really in a difficult situation, we kind of experience fight or flight a little bit. And, and fight or flight is where part of the brain shuts down the frontal cortex where you think clearly, and it shifts to the old reptilian brain, right? It's almost like back in the day, it was a good thing. If you're being chased by a velociraptor, right? Or a Tyrannosaurus Rex, you don't want to stand there going, what are my options? You don't want to be in the frontal cortex. You want to be out of there, right? Fight or flight. But most of our problems, they don't need that. We don't need to be in that state. In fact, it's not helpful because you can't think clearly. These people don't have a problem with that. Calm under pressure, very capable, coming up with more options and ideas. As a leader, people will gravitate towards them. They are good at handling difficult situations. Isn't that true, Squares? 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Quite modest as well. Thank you. Uh, anyone find themselves being drawn more to the triangle out of interest? So equal again this morning, same sort of size, one or two more perhaps. If I was to ask you as a group of leaders, irrespective of what you lead, whether it's a large team, a project, a, whatever it might be, but the, the concept of leading, what are the attributes of a great leader? There are many answers to that question. But if I collected all your views in, the top answer always is visionary. Always visionary. The ability to set a vision, to create a, a, a future, an aim, an ambition, a target, to set some direction, not just the actual direction of where we're going, but to create an energy in the room that people want to move towards it. They create a, a dynamic, people want to move towards a vision or a future that they've been part of creating. Every leader, without exception, has to be in that kind of space at some point. Otherwise, you're managing. I can manage the situation, but if I'm leading, that suggests from somewhere to somewhere. Where somewhere. Right? This ability to think about the future. These people, the seven or eight, have a natural disposition to future pace, they call it. The triangle is like an arrowhead. It's got direction. It's got purpose. These people know where they're going. They know what they're going for. Right? But they're dynamic in their thinking. Why dynamic? Well, because the triangle faces one of three ways. There's no preference. So when things change, they'll change. They refocus. They move on. They value the past, but they don't reflect too heavily on, I wish it was the way it used to be, because they recognize that's futile. Right? They'll take what's useful there and they move forward. Future thinkers, future pacers make fantastic leaders around change. Isn't that true, Triangles? Very modest indeed. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Anyone find themselves being drawn more to the circle? As majority, same this morning, and it always is. And it's good news. Good news. With the team of influencers and leaders and managers, you want the majority to fit into this category. These people have worked something out. And in every bit of data we looked at around complex matrix teams, global teams, etc., the high performing leaders fit into this category. Because it's not that they're not people, people per se, but they get the dynamic of people. They get how critical that, that process is of engaging. The circle is very inclusive. They want to draw people in, they want to work with people, around people, for people, through people. There's no sharp edges on a circle. These are smooth operators, good influencers, right? good at drawing people in, rallying around. When it comes to leading, these people get the biggest impact. They have the biggest impact because they get the people dynamic. Isn't that true, circles? Thank you much, thank you much, thank you much. Finally, is there anyone left that couldn't resist the temptation <laughs> to go for the flash of Zorro? Nice and high, Zorros. If you can keep your hand up for this entire description, okay? No, no, keep it up. Yeah, these are the ones you have to watch, by the way. <laughs> All the others have a heavy tendency towards what I've said, sometimes an exception to the rule, not these. These without exception. You be the judge. They all seem to have an unhealthy obsession with alcohol and sex. I don't know why. <laughs> I can't explain it. I don't know what it is. They just do. They just do. Okay, so there's your team. There you go. <laughs> so you probably now realize, after the final reveal, that this is all a complete and utter load of rubbish that I completely made up, which I did. Um, if it's true, happy coincidence, right? Now, it's about this point, you get one or two sitting there going, I am dynamic. <laughs> and one or two going, I'm obsessed with alcohol and sex. But even if it is, it's just coincidence. I made it up, it was random. Some of it I made up in the moment. But the point is, the fact that I happen to be stood here, is it fair to say that until the last bit, some people in the room might have thought there was some truth to this? Is that possible? I mean, not you, but the others, right? <laughs> Just because I'm stood here with all this, this all helps, by the way. By the way, if you were here and I was there, it'd be the same in, in, in return. I happen to be stood here, all the regalia. I'm able to do one thing which is absolutely critical so whether it's cultural change, behavioral change, high performance, as a leader, I managed to influence your thinking. Whether you knew it or not, I managed to connect two things, a known and an unknown. That a square means this. That a triangle means you're like this. That the, the markets mean this. The general conditions mean this. The budget means this. I managed to connect two things, something that you're familiar with, a shape, and some content that I wanted to link. If I can affect your thinking, as a leader, I can affect your behavior. I can't change your behavior without affecting your thinking first. It doesn't work, right? Thoughts precede behavior. Behavior precedes results, which precedes culture. So there's something in this around influencing what someone thinks. The good news is, the very nature of your role, you cannot not be doing this, right? You cannot not influence. You're an influencer, you're a leader, you're a manager, you walk in a room, you're my boss, 
You cannot not influence me. And the question is, how do we utilize that, that responsibility right, and that opportunity if you're talking about change, like a cultural program that's part of your, your operation, your organization? Right? What's the connection then that we have that makes that, make that work? Or not, as the case may be. We're going to test a few things. We'll see. We'll judge by results.